Good morning. It's August 1st of 2021 and it is the Lord's Day and this is our eighth try at doing this right. <laughs> so if we laugh, don't worry about it. Fuzzy's back here behind the camera and he's making mistakes right and left. But anyway, I'll blame it all on him. Not having a good day. Okay, here we go. Let us look at the Word of God. Hear this word that I have taken up over you in lamentations, O house of Israel. Fallen to rise no more is the virgin of Israel, forsaken on her land, with none to raise her up. For thus saith the Lord, The city that went out for a thousand will come back with a hundred, and those who go out with a hundred, there will be ten left. Thus saith the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel, do not enter into Gilgah, or cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal will go into exile, and Bethel will come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devours with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth, he who made Pallades and Orion and turns deep darkness into morning and darkness the night of the day, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them on the surface of the earth, the Lord is the same, who makes destruction flash forth against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. They hate him who reproves the gate and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because they trample on the poor, you exact taxes of grain from him. You have built houses of hewn stone, and you do not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, and you do not drink their wine. For I know how many your transgressions are, and how great is your sin. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and turn aside the needy at the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silence in such a time, for there is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. So saith the Lord, the host, God of hosts, will be with you. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice at the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing. In all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas, they shall call the farmers to mourning and wailing to those who are skilled in lamentations in all the vineyards. They'll be wailing, for I have passed through your midst. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him and went into his house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no darkness in it? Even though you offer me a burnt offering and great offerings, I will not accept them. The peace offerings of your fatted animal I will not look upon. Take away the noise of your songs, the melody of the harps I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteous like an ever-flowing stream. Did you bring me sacrifice and offering during the forty years of wilderness, O house of Israel? You take up Shicketh your king, and Kingion your star god. Your images have made for yourself. But I will send you in exile beyond Damascus, thus saith the Lord, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Well, that was a long scripture reading. Someone said to me the other day, they read the book of Obadiah and they didn't get heads nor tails out of it. As I read this today, so many thoughts come to my mind because I've been studying this all week. The key verses... Our verse 14 and 15, seek the Lord and not evil, do good. It says, seek well, love God, that God may be with you. Well, one of the overwhelming themes in this chapter is that judgment is settled in verse 1, 2, 3, and 27. 
It says the virgin of Israel has fallen. She rises no more. Only 10% will survive. In verse 27, they will be taken to Syria in captivity. Well, it's been decided and determined that Israel will be destroyed. God has pulled away his protection. It will happen. Now, 30 years from the date that it was said to have happened, or that uh, Amos made this proclamation 30 years later, approximately, Israel was carried off uh, by the Syrians into captivity. And another 130 years more, Judah was taken. So sometimes God has decided. We don't know when God has decided. I mean, we know that there is a day of his coming and for us as people, when we die, then judgment comes. Or when Christ comes, we don't know when that is, but Christ and God do. But nations and churches and groups also have a day of judgment. And it could be that even in our nation, while things are going well, that God is already frustrated with our sin and has called us to repentance, but maybe has come to the point where he said, I'm done, certain day, it's over. So in light of this concept, he still tells us to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. He said religion will be destroyed. There will not be any religion. You need to be in a relationship with God himself. Seek the Lord because God is a consuming fire. He will burn everything on earth. Seek the Lord. He's, the reality of sin is, is that he sees your sin. He also knows that you hate instruction. You do not like to be told what to do. You want to be independent and do things your way. He also says the love of money is part of our problem and oppression of people that we don't like. And God knows your sin in verse 12. He knows everything about you. And he said it is an evil time, a time for silence. You know, one of the things that's happened in the last five years in our nation is it has become an evil time, a time for silence. I remember not many years ago, in fact, up in all my life until five years ago, you were free to say whatever you well pleased. You could be a radical. You could be ridiculous. You could get up and say whatever you want. People might not like it, but they said that's his right to say it. Now we have moved into an era where you'd better be careful what you say. You may not get a job. You may not get a loan. You may be uh, ostracized. You may be uh, put aside. You might be persecuted in many, many ways because you don't say the right things. That is an evil time, God says. So he says, seek the Lord, desire good that you may live, hate evil. A lot of people now love evil. I'll tell you how I know, because evil is built into a lot of entertainment and attracts a lot of people. Establish justice. That means treat everybody right. And grace comes to the desirous. Those who desire God will get grace. Now, the third thing God says is that there will be a spreading suffering in his presence. When God shows up on the scene for judgment, it will be a hard day. It will be a time of wailing in the streets, complaining on the highways, work stoppages. I mean, even the farmers leave their fields to complain. Professional mourners, crying in the vineyards, all of this thing, a national time of mourning, it will happen because God passes through. He shows up. It should be a wonderful thing for God to come in our midst, but it's not a wonderful thing if we have sinned against him. The fourth thing we see in the scripture is a serious thought of judgment. We desire the day of the Lord. For Christians, the rapture is not the day of the Lord. The rapture is a time when we are caught away 
to be with Jesus. And it is a time of spiritual consumption. We long for that. We long to be free from the troubles of this world, free from sickness and financial struggles and relational problems. We long to be free from injustice. We long for that day when Jesus shall reign and we can see him in heaven and we see him in his power and majesty and, and all his enemies are put at his feet. We long for that day. But... That day is also a day of doom for unbelievers. The Bible says, Woe to them who desire the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is described as darkness and not light, as a day of entrapment. Well, let's think about darkness and not light. Let's think of the days that you remember. How many of you remember when JFK was shot. That's the older people. How many of you remember 9-11? How many of you remember the day the federal building was bombed in Oklahoma? These are days that caught us and took our breath away. These are days that we mourned, and I remember in all those days. In fact, when 9-11 came, my children are running a paper out and several people dropped their prescription or subscriptions because they were afraid of the future and didn't know if they could pay for the paper. They suddenly shut down everything they were paying for. I bought a car that week or a couple weeks later. And the reason I bought the car was is that the dealer said, nobody's come in to look at a car. <laughs> And I always look at cars. And he was about ready to give some way to sell it. He said he, people even uh, dropped their appointments for changing their oil and getting fixing done. He says we were sitting here twiddling our thumbs and everything stopped. Well, that's a day of darkness. And the day of the Lord will be such a day of fear. And it's a, a day of entrapment. Entrapment means you can't get away. And it's described as a man who was walking through the field and he sees a lion and he runs from the lion and he gets away and there he meets a bear. And then he gets away and he gets in his house and says, I'm safe. And he puts his hand up on a wall and there's a viper that bites him and he dies. You just can't get away. That's the day of the Lord. Not something we should want. The last thing in this issue of seek the Lord is God's scorn for worship. Now, worship is a big thing in our era of history. Churches are judged more on their worship style than on their theology. Churches grow more on their worship style than their theology. Oh, they want to see the best drummers, the best guitarists, the best singers, and little smoke and foggers running on the stage, and it's got to be cool. But here's what God says in his attitude. He says, number one, I, and, and there are, eight, actually, I wrote down seven, there are eight. There are eight, because I saw one last night in here when I was studying after I got done. There are eight. He says, number one, I hate. Whoa. When someone says, I hate, better listen to him. Number two, I despise. Number three, I do not savor. Number four, I will not accept. Number five, nor will I regard. Number six, take away from me. Number seven, I will not listen. And somewhere in there, there is one more. And I should write it down, but I, I missed it. Okay. Well, you know what that sounds like to me? I was never served in the armed services, but I'm a veteran of the worship wars when the progressive and the young people fought the old people and it was hymns versus praise and worship and I'm a veteran I'm a scarred veteran I should get a purple heart you know I went through a lot on that and thank God I hope we're past all that but this sounds like a very bitter old person who loved hymns only who said <clears throat> 
I hate them new songs. I despise those new songs. I don't savor those new songs. I will not accept those new songs, nor will I regard. Take away from me. I will not listen. That's what it sounds like. But this is not a bitter old person whose times have changed. This is God. Now remember God, he can handle the style of music. He don't care if you got drums, guitars, an organ, a harpsichord. Uh, he doesn't really care because God listens to a variety of worship. You know, I am sure that when we get to China, South Africa, Germany, South America, Mexico, North America, and Australia, that all of the worship is different. They don't all use the style of worship you grew up in, besides if you're a hymner, you only, that was only a popular style of worship for about 300 years. And there were many, many years before that when they did many types of things. God looks on the heart. That's the problem. God looks in the heart and he said, I've had enough. I don't care whether they sing hymns. I don't care what they sing. I don't care if they're in Africa with a bunch of drums and the fan dance that they do when they worship. I don't care if they're in Australia and their hill song. I don't care what they are. He said, it's the heart. And he says, I don't see a love for God. I don't see any justice. I don't see any true righteousness. What I see is a lot of people that come to church and get all excited about the singers and the worship and the style and the, the emotion of it. Oh, I feel so good. But they walk outside and they're unchanged and they have no regard for God and they go out and live the same way they always lived. The historical setting for this is the children of Israel in the wilderness. They had no faith. Oh, we can't take the land. They were disobedient to God. And then they worship idols. One of the interesting things, and I've never studied this, I now have thought about it a little bit as it was mentioned here. And from what little study, we really don't know how much worship went on in those 40 years of wandering when the old people died and the young people were being raised under Moses. It seems like them old people, they rejected God and refused to follow him. And there's not much record of their worship. The focus of worship should be on a righteous heart. Whether we have music or we don't have music, whether we're like uh, the Wesleys who m didn't have much music, although they did sing a cappello, and they met in barns and schoolhouses and wherever. It's about the heart. It's about confessing sin and getting right with God and living for Jesus and obeying his word. And God said, I am so tired of all of this professional worship without any heart change. He said, it makes me sick. So this chapter is all about seeking the Lord. He says, it makes me so sick. I've determined that Israel as a nation will be no more. I believe God could say that about the church, that he may strike down the church. Well, he'll never strike it down. There'll be a new church, but the church as we know it might disappear and God will start something new. It's happened many times over the ages. We could go back to the late 1800s and the churches that were preaching the gospel begin to go liberal. And guess what happened? God started new churches. And where are those churches today? Well, they've gone way off the deep end and their numbers are few. God always has a group of people that praise him and he don't care whether they're in a great big old fancy church with big fancy musicians or whether they're back in a little clapboard church on the wrong side of the tracks. He's looking for people that have a heart for him and people who confess sin and obey. That's what God is looking for. So in conclusion, let us turn to Isaiah 55, which is a great chapter, verse 6 and 7. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Shall we pray? Almighty, most merciful Father, I pray your blessing upon our people that the conviction of God may speak to their heart, and I don't even know what he should speak to them about. It's a deep and personal individual thing with each one. But help us to confess our sins and get right with God. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.